um, the last talk of the day, so let's have a little fun with this one. Um, my name is Ann Cahalan. I'm an application developer at uh, Detroit Labs, which is a mobile agency in Detroit, Michigan, and I'm a graduate of their apprenticeship program. And this past summer, I was assigned to a project using Swift. It was actually the first project that we were starting from scratch with Swift and putting into the App Store. And so I had to learn pretty quickly on the job. And I discovered that it was actually a lot of fun and pretty cool to use. I had learned uh, Ruby originally, and then a couple years ago learned Objective-C. And I like to compare that transition to going from, being hugging, from hugging puppies to being punched in the face. Um, but I found that Swift, on the other hand, was a lot friendlier and a lot easier to use. And as I got better, about it, or better at it, I found that there were a couple of things I really liked. And I have the misfortune of sitting right next to the person who runs our blog. So as I was talking about what I liked about Swift, she was pressuring me to write something about it. So I ended up writing a blog post about how I was kind of falling in love with guard statements a little bit, because they reminded me of like a romantic hero charging in to like make order out of chaos. Um, and then the more I thought about it, the more I was starting to realize that there were a lot of things about Swift that were reminding me of romantic heroes, particularly those of my favorite author, Jane Austen. Um, I didn't see a whole lot of hands for people who were fans of Jane Austen, but I think you'll, there's one over there, um, and one over there. But the truth is, if you have interacted with popular culture at all in any way ever, you have, you're familiar with the work of Jane Austen. Um, her plots have been ripped off and copied by just about every sitcom and romantic comedy ever. Um, she originally wrote six novels between 1787 and 1811. Um, she's wrote mainly about the lives of women and how they were navigating the sort of social constraints of their time. Um, for a while, she got dismissed as having just written sort of silly romantic novels where, you know, nothing really happened and everybody got married at the end. Um, this is getting to be less true as a criticism of her because as you read her stuff, she really does have a lot of really cutting social insight and commentary going on in her books. Um, but we're not here to talk about literary criticism in Jane Austen or feminism in Jane Austen, but I'll be here all weekend if that's a thing you do want to talk about. We're here to talk about Swift and Jane Austen. So let's start with what is probably Jane Austen's most famous work, Pride and Prejudice and one of the most famous design patterns in Swift, delegates and protocols. Now, I promised you guys that there was no homework. You didn't have to do any reading beforehand. So I'm going to recap the plot of all of the books that I'm talking about very quickly for you. Um, I will warn you that I'm glossing over a lot. Um, Austin's novels are these like tightly knit clockwork things where a million parts come together at just the right moment. You guys might be familiar with stuff like that. Um, <laughs> but I'm just gonna blow right through all of that and give you the, the top level overview. Um, so Pride and Prejudice starts when Fitzwilliam Darcy shows up at Netherfield Hall and sort of immediately horrifies the neighbors, and then he is in turn horrified by them. He makes a particularly bad impression at a local ball on um, Miss Elizabeth Bennet, the second oldest of six Bennet sisters. Shortly thereafter, an army officer shows up, and he is much more charming and makes a much better impression on everyone. Um, some stuff happens, a lot of stuff happens actually, but Darcy starts to warm up to Lizzie and starts taking liking to her. She in turn takes, takes a liking to Wickham, who seems to be a lot nicer. Um, so one day, Darcy comes to her and says, even though her family's appalling and she's terribly socially beneath him and he's spent a lot of time trying really hard not to be, he's in love with her and so they should get married. Little free tip from me to you. If you are ever in a position where you're declaring your undying love and trying to like propose marriage to someone, don't lead with how they're embarrassing and awful and how you tried really hard not to get to this point. It won't work out well for you. It didn't work out well for Darcy. Um, unfortunately, after Darcy or after Lizzie told Darcy to take a hike, her younger sister disappears with Mr. Wickham, which is a huge deal because this is 1790s England and you can't just go running off for a dirty weekend with somebody. You have to get married. It's going to bring shame on the entire family. Her father goes chasing after them, can't catch up to them, and all of a sudden it turns out everything's going to be okay. Someone has basically bribed Wickham into marrying Lydia, and the family won't fall into shame and ruin. Um, Darcy didn't want anybody to know, but it's found out that Darcy is the guy who paid him off. Um, and Darcy comes back, and he proposes again, and he does a much better job of it, and they get married, of course. But 
The important part, the part that you've probably heard a million times, is this story of two people meet, kind of hate each other, and then slowly one falls for the other one, and that one still hates them, and then slowly wins her over. You've seen that story before. Let's talk about protocols and delegates for a second. This is from the Swift documentation. Uh, a rough translation of this into English that actual people can read is that a protocol and a delegate is like a blueprint. It's like a contract that the delegate enacts. A protocol lays out a set of properties or functionality that its delegates are expected to have. And the delegate, in turn, gets to implement that functionality however they see fit. For example, let's say you've got some suitors and, or some gentlemen and some scoundrels, and they're going courting. Both of them conform to the wooing delegate, which means they both promise to have a, a method called a wooing attempt. But as you can see, how they enact those two things are incredibly different. This is a cute example, but why does that matter? Well, let's say you're keeping track of all of your suitors in a table view, because you like to be organized. And you want each table view cell to have a little button you can tap that will let you know what this suitor's best attempt at wooing is. By using a delegate, your table view cell doesn't need to know what kind of data it has in it. It doesn't need to know if this particular cell is holding a scoundrel or a gentleman. It just knows that when you tap a button, you're going to see an attempt at wooing. And it can go on its way, not caring about what actually is going on in there. So how did I think that these were like Mr. Darcy? When I first encountered protocols and delegates, they seemed a little, for lack of a better word, smug to me. It seemed like uh, my code knew something that I didn't, and I didn't like that very much. Um, why couldn't I do something like this with inheritance? Why did I have to do something fancy and, and kind of incomprehensible? Or maybe by coupling that data together between the table view cell and the data it contains. Um, as it turns out, that's a very bad idea and will lead to all sorts of Wickham-level disgrace. Uh, your family will fall into shame if you do that sort of thing, so don't do it. Also, it turns out, as you're reading Pride and Prejudice, that Mr. Darcy was basically just an awkward guy with kind of resting bitch face. Um, he, people felt like he was judging them, but really he was just kind of hanging around a ball in 1790s England, wondering why he was wearing tights, which I think is a situation we would all find ourselves in. Um, when I first encountered these delegates and protocols, they seemed really inscrutable. Like there was this wall that was keeping me from my code and what my code was doing. But in the end, having this cleanly separated code that is following a socially approved contract and keeping everything from being intermingled uh, indiscreetly is going to save you from all kinds of disaster. Kind of like Darcy in the background saving the day. So that's Mr. Darcy and protocols and delegates, and maybe a little bit about judging things too quickly. Let's talk about what is not necessarily my favorite switch, Swift feature, but absolutely my, definitely my favorite Austin hero, um, Captain Wentworth from Persuasion. I used to keep a copy of Persuasion in my car and read the good parts when I was stuck in traffic. Now I have it bookmarked on my phone because we have technology. So Persuasion is one of those novels that sort of opens seven years later, like after a bunch of stuff has happened. Um, seven years before the opening of the book, and Elliot broke an engagement to an army officer uh, named Frederick Wentworth. He was confident and ambitious, but he didn't come from a long-standing family name. He didn't uh, have a lot of money. Her family had a title in like, one of those halls that has a name on it. Um, and her sister and her father were convinced that she was sort of marrying beneath her station if she would have married him. So they convinced her to break it off. Time passes. Freddie Wentworth goes off to the Napoleonic Wars, kills a bunch of French guys, and becomes Captain Wentworth, who is incredibly wealthy and incredibly celebrated. Meanwhile, Anne kind of became a sad old spinster. Um, and the Elliot family, to make matters worse, her father has been blowing through the family fortune, and now they are so broke that they have to rent out and leave this fancy hall with a name on it. Um, because this is a novel, they end up renting it out to friends of... Uh, Captain Wentworth's. So one day they're all out for a walk with a bunch of women, uh, a bunch of other women, including one that uh, Captain Wentworth might be interested in. She takes a fall and is terribly injured. Um, 
And it's a whole lot of like everybody freaking out and panicking and ladies fainting and Anne sort of handles herself calmly and like gets everything handled, gets the doctor, gets everybody back home. Uh, Wentworth starts to reconsider, but uh, still kind of annoyed about the whole getting dumped thing. Uh, fast forward a little bit, they're in a drawing room. Anne is having a conversation with a friend of theirs who has lost his wife about whether men or women fall out of love more quickly. And this is kind of awkward because Wentworth is like sitting right there. But he overhears this conversation and he overhears her sort of delicate explanation of this guy that she dumped, but she kind of regrets it. Um, writes a beautiful letter that he hides somewhere where she will find it, declaring his love. And of course, they get married and live happily ever after. So let's go back to our table view of suitors. Let's say we wanted to change our tint color based on our uh, setting and our, some label text based on which suitor we're talking about. This works. Right? I mean, it gets the job done. It's kind of complicated. Digging into it for debugging might get a little messy. Um, reading through it kind of takes a week. But this is what you do when you learn how to program. At least, I don't know how it goes in the fancy academies of computer science. I went to a web development boot camp. And an if statement was pretty much the first time I told a computer to make a decision. It was the first programming of any kind that I had done. It was something that I knew. And that was a known quantity to me. This is easier to scan. It's a little cleaner to read. Uh, I don't know that it, it, in readability it gains a whole lot. I think it gains a little bit. But this was not something I was terribly familiar with. These existed at Objective-C. I saw it. I don't know how you guys are going, but I've seen more of this in Swift than I ever did in Objective-C. Um, and it was, for me, just one more thing I kind of had to wrap my head around in a moment when I was throwing question marks randomly in my code to try and get it to build. Um, so basically, I couldn't see what this offered me that was improvement on what I already knew and what I already had. But as it turns out, those if blocks are expensive. They're expensive with your intention and with your brain power. And I won't bore you with my entire work history, but this app in Swift that I had been working on was a, a food ordering app. And we had a lot of reusable menu components that were going to change very slightly based on whether, excuse me, whether or not it was a delivery order or a pickup order or whether it was the main menu or the side items menu. And I was starting to code these incredibly dense and much like creeping this way if blocks that were getting harder and harder for me to hold into my head and getting more and more expensive with my attention. So like Wentworth, this switch statement thing has been around for a while. But in Objective-C, they were kind of limited. Um, you could really only do very specific types, uh, integral types that you could switch on. But Swift has given these a much broader horizons now. You can do a lot more with them. You can switch on strings, or on types, or on ranges, which I think is really cool, or on tuples. And after a little bit of refactoring and a little bit of reconsidering, I'm with Anne. I'm about ready to marry a switch statement. So we've got the thing that I kind of hated that eventually won me over. And we've got the thing that I finally saw the value of after a while. Um, but I sort of tipped you off earlier about where my heart really lies with uh, Swift. So let's get to my second favorite Austin hero, but my absolute favorite thing in Swift. And that would be guard statements and Colonel Brandon from Sense and Sensibility. Uh, we're going to talk about the B plot of Sense and Sensibility, because the A plot of Sense and Sensibility is, revolves around fascinating things like inheritance law and the wacky hijinks you can get up to when you have four brothers all called Mr. Ferrers. Um, so you've got Marianne Dashwood. Marianne Dashwood is a very romantic and sensitive soul. She is looking for her like one true love constantly. Um, and she's out walking on the moors one day, and she sprains her ankle, and Mr. Willoughby rides up. And it's raining. They're walking on the moors. He comes charging up on his horse. I think he's wearing a cape. There is like every romance novel cliche you can imagine gets crammed into this one moment. And she falls for that sort of thing, hook, line, and sinker, obviously. They're inseparable for a little while. They're deeply in love. Um, but suddenly, he leaves for London and stops responding to her letters. Meanwhile, in the neighborhood, there is Colonel Brandon, who's a little bit older, kind of practical, doesn't seem to be the sort of swooning romantic hero that she's looking for. But he's definitely interested in her, and she thinks he's boring. 
So Marianne eventually does get to London, and she does run into Willoughby again at a public dance where he's incredibly rude to her and points out that he's already been, in, he's been engaged this whole time to a wealthy heiress. Marianne is obviously not wealthy. Um, distraught, Marianne falls ill. She's one of those. You know, she got sick and just over the disappointment of it. Um, Colonel Brandon helps care for her. He goes riding off to bring her mother to the, the manor where she's staying. He sits at her bedside and reads her sonnets until she recovers. Um, and of course, they get married and happily ever after. You've heard this story again, too, where the woman or someone falls for a confusing jerk, gets her heart broken, and then sees the value in the you know, steady, reliable guy that's been there the whole time. The mind turns naturally to guard statements in this moment. Again, this is from the docs. And basically, a quick explanation for guard statements, if you're not familiar with them, is that they're a significant improvement on the uh, if x equals not y do a thing construction. So let's say we want to add some suitors to our list of suitors here. And we're going to need to know each potential suitor's name, his income, whether he has a hat, and whether he has a horse, because we have standards. This, this is really confusing. This kind of looks like it's your friend because it sort of looks familiar to you. It's going to cozy up to you and make all kinds of promises. Um, and it's going to think you think it's lining up to exactly what you expect. But when you need to debug this kind of code in a hurry because you need to get a build to the client by the end of the day, that's when this code fucks off to London and stops taking your calls. The most important part of this code, the thing that it actually does that you need to know about, is buried like 17 indentations in and is surrounded by a whole lot of cruft that you're going to have to dig through. You've got to be very careful with this code because it's easy to look at it quickly, get ahead of yourself, and make assumptions that are, are not true. As far as Marianne Dashwood was concerned, the most important thing she needed to know about Willoughby, that he was kind of a jerk and that he was already engaged, was just as hidden as the, like, functional part of this code. This on the other hand is a little straightforward. Everything is right up front where you can see it. You can immediately see all of the points of exit. Uh, and the most important part, the part where something's actually happening, is right up there wearing its heart on its sleeve just like Colonel Brandon was. And it looks, at first glance, really kind of practical, really kind of solid. But if you really take a look at what a guard statement is doing, it's kind of poetic. It's kind of beautiful. There's some artfulness to, to what is being said here that doesn't come at the expense of readability. And I really like that. Marianne, when I went to go see the, the movie version of Sense and Sensibility that came out several years ago, the person I went to go see it with at the end of the movie hated it. And he was t I was like, why did you possibly hate this movie? It was beautiful. Um, he thought that at the end of the movie, Marianne had settled for Colonel Brandon, that she had been in love with this, you know, romantic Willoughby that came riding in, and she couldn't have him, so she settled for the boring guy. And I was like, that's not the that opposite of what happened. That's not at all what happened in that movie. What happened was she was looking for someone who would be her hero in the moment when she needed it, and who would read to her the kind of poetry that she loved. And that is exactly what Brandon did. What she was looking for she found in a place she never expected to find it. For me, that's kind of the power of a guard statement, because I find something really beautiful and really powerful in the way they work, in something I found a little poetry, in somewhere I was never really looking for it. I think guard statements are elegant both in the scientific and the artistic sense, both in what they are doing and in how they're doing it. Um, there's a gracefulness of language. We call it syntax that's at work here. It's beautiful in a way that I, you don't really expect code to be, I think. And I know that code can be a creative endeavor. We all know that. But I don't think people expect to see actual poetry. And for me, that's what a guard statement is. The difference between a complicated if-let construction and a guard statement for me is kind of like the difference between listening to someone who writes an advice column tell you how important it is to accept your partner's faults and, and to like, love a whole person for everything that they are. And the difference between that and having someone say to you, 
Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It's an ever fixed mark. They're saying the same thing, and they're both right. But one is true in this kind of small t sense, and one is true in this sort of capital T universal sense. And as I was reflecting on that, I came to a really kind of sobering thought. And that is, if you can find that kind of capital T universal truth in your code, that means you can put that kind of capital T universal truth into your code. It's a powerful realization and a big responsibility. Code can be creative, but how often do we spend thinking of ourselves as creators in the same way as playwrights or poets or sculptors? If programming is the new literacy, which is something I see everywhere, what is it we're writing? We can have control over huge parts of our users' lives, over their financial information, over their personal information. If you're writing something like a dating app, over their hopes and dreams for the future. If you're writing some sort of social networking app, it's over their own self-expression. What greater truths are we revealing and creating about privacy and security and safety, and social interaction with our code? In general, I feel like I spend a lot of time looking at the, thinking that the code that I am looking at is a garden, and I am constantly astonished by it. Um, by the powerful things that we can do and the interesting ways that we can do them, and by the ways that we can use syntax to express not just a function, but an idea. Well-written code should always tell a story, just as clearly as any novel does. And hopefully, this afternoon, I have given you another way of thinking about your code that will let you, whether it's Swift or not, go off and write some code stories that are as truthful and as universal as Jane Austen's were. I am north of normal on pretty much all of the things, and I would love to hear about your code heroes and your code stories after this. Thank you. Thank you.